Well, hey there, folks, and welcome to The Roundup. We are a podcast featuring voices, opinions, perspectives, and stories from interesting people in the cowboy state. I'm your host, Wendy Kaur, and we have such an interesting person for our podcast today. We're going to be talking with Candy Moulton. Now, her name might not be familiar, but when I start telling you about all of her accomplishments and all the things she's done, you've probably read some of her work or seen one of her documentary films. Candy has been writing in Wyoming. She grew up in Wyoming. She's been writing here since she was 16 years old and has made an amazing name for herself in the documentary film world, as well as on the pages of newspapers, magazines, and in books for for years now. And Candy, I just wanted to say hello and welcome. And we're so glad to have you on the roundup today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. We've got so much to talk about. And so I don't want to delay too long because there's your your accomplishments, your body of work is just tremendous. And I, I'm going to start out by asking you what I always ask people with the roundup is, you're Wyoming. You are Wyoming through and through. Candy, tell me about growing up in Wyoming. I grew up in encampment on a ranch that my grandparents homesteaded and worked the ranch with my parents as a kid. I always say my first job, I was six years old and I went to the hayfield and started working and um, worked on the ranch until I was old enough to get a real job, which because ranch didn't really pay, right? You know, you just do the work. And um, my first real job where I made a, a quarter an hour, I was a soda jerk at the soda at the sugar bowl in encampment. And then I started writing for the Saratoga Sun newspaper. And that set me on a trajectory that I never expected and never anticipated. And that's been a good ride. Well, you're still on that trajectory. How many people find their life's work when they're 16 years old? But you did. I did. Yeah. You know, it actually it kind of started even a little earlier than that when I think about it, because I, I was in 4-H, you know, when you're on a ranch, you're in 4-H because you have steers and you have sheep and things like that. And I, I got involved in a, in photography in 4-H and I had my 4-H leader was a, a really um, accomplished um, photographer, Grace Healy. And then she taught me how to take pictures. And that's really how I got into writing was through the photography. I started taking pictures for 4-H and then for the Saratoga Sun newspaper and for the school yearbook. I, that's what I was. I wasn't in sports. I was the photographer. <laughs> so I got to go to everything, but I didn't have to practice or anything. <laughs> and then I started working for the newspaper and, and one thing led to another. She became not only my 4-H teacher, but she was my high school English teacher. So, you know, diagramming sentences. Yes, we did that. You know it all. You know yeah. all of the. Yes. Well, I don't know it all, but I certainly learned it. And and there are even today, I think Mrs. Healy would tell me to put that comma in. <laughs> Mrs. Healy still lives in your head. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. She's there. <laughs> I love that. And you're still writing for newspapers. I mean, you write for Cowboy State Daily. I do. Yeah. And Jimmy twisted my arm. <laughs> to be real honest, he twisted my arm. He's very good at that. Yeah. Well, yeah. and and he's got you writing about things that you know, though, which is the Cowboy Hall of Fame, the Wyoming Cowboy Hall of Fame. Tell us about your involvement with that. We're kind of diverging from the linear uh, linear career here. But but I'm really interested in your work with the Wyoming Cowboy Hall of Fame. So I um, I have been a volunteer with the Wyoming Cowboy Hall of Fame since it started. When I first heard about it, I, I heard Scotty Ratliff um, was going to start a Cowboy Hall of Fame. And my first book was about cowboys. And I grew up on a ranch. So I've always had an affinity for those guys. And so I called Scotty and said, what can I do to help? And he said, well, you've got lots of skills and you can help us. So I've always done things like their annual program about their cowboys. I did their poster for them every year, blah, 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 did all that stuff. And then uh, a couple of years ago, they had an opening as the executive director and I thought I was retiring. So I thought this would be a great retirement job, right? So I applied for the job and got it and work with a really incredible team at the Wyoming Cowboy Hall of Fame, all the board members and all the volunteers across the state who make the selections of our, our wonderful cowboys who go into Hall of Fame. So uh, it's really bringing me back to my roots. Like I, you know, I'm a ranch girl. That's really what I am. I've got to travel a lot, but 
through and through, I'm most comfortable in my jeans. <laughs> Well, and the fun part is you get to write about the things that you live and the, the things that you love. Tell me about how you got started writing books, because you've got you've got 17 Western history books to your credit. That's a lot of writing, Candy. And tell yeah. me about where how did you get started writing books? Um, it was accidental and it's all my mother-in-law's fault. So <laughs> that is true. So Back in 1990, Pete Filler up, Peter Filler up, Peter and Filler up, up in Cody was developing a sculpture for the University of Wyoming called Fanning a Twister. It stands outside the Arena Auditorium over at UW in Laramie. And so Pete was working on this. He is a friend of the Moulton family. And my mother in law, Flossie, was living up on the South Fork out of Cody. And he was patterning this horse off of Steamboat, that great Wyoming bucking horse that is on our license plate. And so he called, he knew that Flossie had personal connections to the Cowboys because her, her grandfather was one of the Cowboys that rode Steamboat. And he was the Cowboy that was used for the University of Wyoming Cowboy logo. So his name is Guy Holt. And Pete knew that because he was a family friend of the Moultons and he's called Flossie and said, would, you know, I'm going to do this sculpture. I think we should have a little book to go along that tells some of the history of this store of this horse. Would you write it? And she said, well, I would maybe work on it, but I think we should get Candy involved. So that's how I started doing my first book. And um, Nancy Curtis, the great Wyoming publisher, you should interview her on this show sometime, Wendy. <laughs> She started High Plains Press and she tells all, she's just made a career of bringing to life these Wyoming history stories. And so we were very fortunate that she agreed to publish the book on Steamboat. And I thought writing a book was just a longer article, right? It's just more words. It's a little different than that. Nancy taught me how to write a book. Uh, I her a lot an awful lot and so steamboat came out and it's a story it kind of ties right into the cowboy hall of fame because it's a story about our wyoming bucking horse steamboat and the cowboys who rode him most of them got bucked off but a lot of men tried to ride him a few actually did ride him and it started with guy holt and peter feller up so that's how i started writing books and you've got 16 more after that what's your most recent book my newest book is Sacagawea, Mystery, Myth, and Legend, that was published by the um, South Dakota Historical Society Press. Um, it is a biography of a, a very important Native American woman who has a, a life that is really hard to find and really hard to follow. I, I say I wrote a book about a woman that I don't know how to say her name correctly because it's said different ways by different people in different areas of the country. I don't know how to spell it because it's spelled multiple ways. Uh, I don't know exactly when she was born nor exactly where she was born. I don't know exactly when she died nor where she died. And I don't have one word, not one word that she is documented to have said or written. So hi, there, there you go. I wrote a book. <laughs> wow. And I mean, you saying all that makes me very intrigued. And I, I want to read the book because if there's that little known about her, I'm really curious that the impact that she had. And I bet when you're writing your books, you learn so much and it whets your appetite for even, even more knowledge and more learning. Almost every book leads to another idea for another book, you know, whether it's on a related topic or a side tangent topic, almost everything. I mean, you do research, especially the part I like about writing the books. Honestly, I love the research. I love going in the archives and going through old newspaper clippings. And that's how I got started. I mean, really, I got started when I was working at the Saratoga Sun. And I I was just there at lunchtime because I didn't have anywhere to go. And so I would get the old newspapers down and there were a couple of ladies in Saratoga that came every week and they started researching and they were real historians, local historians. And they just inspired me to start reading those newspapers. I thought, if they're so interested in this old stuff, what's in there? And I started reading and, and making notes and, you know, my first real documented history that I wrote was when I was in college at Northwest up in Powell. 
I had John Hinckley for my history teacher, and I did a, I did a piece about Jedediah Smith, uh, the great mountain man. And so it just, one thing led to another. I also did a story at that time in that history class that be actually became the core of my book that I wrote about Grand Encampment um, and uh, the encampment mining boom. So, you know, <laughs> things just lead one to another. And sometimes it's like 40 years before you actually use it. But it's there. It's there in your head and you're, you kind of let it germinate, let that seed, let that seed grow. Yeah. I, I do want to speak real quickly, going back to your Sacagawea book, you have more, you, you've recently won a really wonderful award from Western yeah. Writers of America. Tell me about the Spur Award. So the Spur Awards are given every year um, by Western Writers of America. They've been given since 1953 when the organization started and they are for the best in Western literature um, throughout, from all the writers throughout the country. And we have international members and international people who enter the Spur Awards. You don't have to be a member to enter. There are 17 different categories. And this year, Sacagawea is the winner of the biography, Best Western Biography category. So thrilled about that. That's wonderful. And you had, of course, really great um, other Wyoming authors were also honored this year. And so you're in some fantastic company because Craig Johnson won. Yeah. And and uh, Michael Gear Correct. won. And yeah. And, and CJ Box has won in the past, and so has Kathleen Gear. I mean, you've had you've got a, a wonderful community of Western writers that are your peers here. Well, Wyoming has Wyoming has a really, really rich literary tradition, not only historically, but today. There are so, absolutely some of the best writers in the country live in Wyoming and work in Wyoming, and they all draw their inspiration from this state and the land. And the people, but the land, the land is such a character in everything they write, whether it's Mike and Kathy or Chuck Box. I know Miss Chuck. Okay. Chuck Box. CJ. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've known him since before he was you know, like hardly anything. You know, he's barely out of college. <laughs> well, heck, you work, you, you, you both worked at the Saratoga Sun. Yeah. I was his first editor. So I okay, get that's that. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I met Nate Romanowski long before he was in a book. Let's just put it that way. He was in Chuck's stories and Chuck was writing stories and he didn't have anywhere to go at lunch um, during when we were working at the Saratoga Sun either. So we used to share these hot pastrami sandwiches because we really couldn't afford to buy two because Dick Peru never paid us very much. So we uh, we just buy one and we split this sandwich and he'd give me his stories and I'd read them. And I don't know what I gave him to read, probably something. And so, yeah, we... We kind of grew up together and Dick Peru was our, he really was the guy that gave both of us a really good start in journalism and led to other good things for both of us. That's phenomenal. I love that. Again, Wyoming, it just goes back to Wyoming is just a, a small town. We're a big, small town is what we are. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now your, your work in, in, uh, in uh, writing, in newspapers, you've written for magazines, you've got your books, but you have made a foray into a completely, I guess it's a completely different genre. You are a producer of documentary films. And Candy, tell me how you got started working with documentary films, because you've done a lot of them. I, I always say that I was out of the fire, the frying pan and into the fire of filmmaking because I got started through Western Writers of America. I had met Paul Hutton, um, who was really well known back in the 80s, 90s, particularly. He's a Western historian. He teaches at the University of New Mexico and had been on a lot of documentaries. The National Historic Trails Interpretive Center in Casper was going to be built and they were working on getting it ready to go. And they were ready to hire some company to do the exhibits in the and all the media in the center. And they called this company, Boston Productions, called Paul and asked him if he would work with them as a re to do research and historical research and potentially for him as well to be on camera. And it's, of course, it's all about the Overland Trails, which is something I know a little bit about. And so he said he gave my name. And they called me and what, 25 years later, I'm still working for them doing films. And the first film that I did is the Footsteps to the West, which is the main feature film 
theater in the trail center in Casper. And it's a five screen theater. It's 17 minutes long. It's this beautiful, rich tapestry of the stories of the Overland trails from the American Indians all the way through to the Pony Express. And it talks about all the trails. So that's how I got started. I didn't know a thing about filmmaking. I understood photography and I understood story and I knew the content. Um, that's that's how I managed to do it and gotten to do lots of other films since then. Yeah, and your most recent one is about Red Buttes. Tell me, tell us about your most recent documentary film. Yeah, so the Battle of Red Buttes is also at the Trail Center in Casper. So 23 years apart, I worked on these two big films for them. And the Battle of Red Buttes is, was done for the BLM. Um, and it, it it plays in a full exhibit that I actually researched and wrote the entire exhibit there. Um, and it is the story of the 1865 battle that was really the first um, encounter in Wyoming between the Native Americans, particularly the Northern Cheyenne, a few Arapahoes, and the Lakota. And it was in direct retribution for what happened at Sand Creek. Um, in November of 1864. And the tribes came together up in the in the Powder River Basin, kind of really near Ten Sleep, west of Ten Sleep. Um, and they planned their what they were going to do in retribution. They had done right right after the the attacks at Sand Creek, which was in November of 64. In January of 65, there were some retaliatory raids that took place along the South Platte River. Um, for, uh, they burned Julesburg three times. They they raided all up and down the South Platte. But then this battle that took place at, at Red Buttes was really the first one in Wyoming. And it really was the first one that was major encounter against the military. And um, in that, in the fight, the, that was where Casper Collins was was killed in the morning of that fight at what is called the Battle of Platte Bridge. And in about noon that day, this small wagon train of, of about 20 soldiers, three supply wagons and about 20 soldiers who were coming back to Fort Casper from out, being out farther west, out by Independence Rock, they were coming back into Casper and they basically rode into this mass of, of Indians who were pretty irritated. And so they attacked and most of those soldiers were killed. There were three or four of them that, that managed to escape and get back to Fort Casper. Plat, well, Platte Bridge is what it was at that time. It became Fort Casper. And so we tell the story about that. We tell from Sand Creek, we, we set it up and then we tell the story of this battle. And it led then to further fighting along the Bozeman Trail. And, and it was the tribes trying to protect their territories. And it was really this, this confluence of cultures. It was where two different types of people, the military, the travelers who were on the Overland Trails were going through and across tribal lands and the tribal members were trying to protect their way of life and their, and their landscape. So that's what it was. We were, what I love about the film most about this film is we worked with some really great tribal um, elders who helped tell this story. We worked some with some great Wyoming historians as well, but we worked with these tribal people and they were directly connected to the people who were involved. So Ben Ridgely, who's Arapaho, Northern Arapaho, he had ancestors who were at Sand Creek. And we talked with Donovan Sprague, who um, is Lakota and Cheyenne, directly related to the Hump family to Crazy Horse. So, um, and then we worked also with Linwood Talbull, who's Northern Cheyenne, and he's directly related to Little Wolf. And Little Wolf was the key leader at that battle. He's Northern Cheyenne. So they told the story. I just got to help them put it together. So I, it's a great film. And I, I really hope everybody first goes to the Trail Center to see it um, so they can see the whole exhibit. But if they can't make it to Casper, you can Google the Battle of Red Buttes and you'll find the full film. Um, is on YouTube. The BLM put it out on YouTube. So really that's, proud of it. That's yeah. fantastic. You know, you talked about how you know just a little bit about Overland Trails. You know yeah. a lot about trails because you travel those trails, but you travel these trails in such a unique way. You actually travel by wagon train. Yeah, I did. I'm this lucky. Is, <laughs> this is so cool. Candy, tell no, me about it. this. Tell, tell us about this. 
So Wendy, being a journalist is the greatest job in the world because you get to do things that other people don't get to do, right? Okay. You get to meet people other people don't get to meet and you just get experiences. So back in 1990, Wyoming's having this little thing called the Centennial. And there was the Wyoming Centennial Wagon Train. It followed the Bridger Trail from Casper um, up to... It, Technically, the Bridger Trail goes out of out of Wyoming over at Ralston, but you kind of got to do what you got to do when you're having a big event. So they went to Powell and then they ended up in Cody because you have a big event, right? So Absolutely. I, I wanted to go really bad, but I had two little kids and there's no way. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a wagon. I didn't have any of the things you needed to go do it. Well, I was writing for the Star Tribune and had been writing for the Star Tribune for well, since 1982, I started writing for them and they called me and they said, hey, we haven't been covering this, but we probably should be in. We need to start covering this wagon train. And by then it was already north of Orleans. It was a couple of weeks into it. It was a month long wagon train. And they said, would you be interested in going and covering it? It's like, oh, yeah, take me, take me. I'm the crazy woman that wants to go and sleep in a tent with rattlesnakes, you know, so. So I got to go do that for two weeks and traveled. My, my in-laws got to have their grandchildren for two weeks. I know it was they were- a win-win. Yeah, exactly. And so I took the kids up and we met out by Warland. They took my kids in my car and I just climbed on a wagon and, and went to Cody. And it was, it was just a blast. And then I was fortunate that night. 1993, Sesquicentennial of the Oregon Trail. And Morris Carter was doing the trail with his four daughters and Ben Kern. They were going from Independence, uh, Missouri to Independence, Oregon, six month trip. And again, the Star Tribune called and said, hey, would you want to cover this? So I traveled off and on. I didn't go that entire route, but I covered that off and on. And got to me meet Ben. We get, became really good friends. We wrote a book together about that called Wagon Wheels, which is he went all the way, obviously, because he drove one of the wagons and he kept a journal, uh, just a video or, uh, on a little tape recorder. He kept a journal and then he gave that to me and I transcribed it and I used his journal, which was the now. And I used I did the research and did the then of the trail. And so it's kind of a back and forth the then and now of the trail. And then I was lucky. I did the California. I did the Mormon trail. I did the Bozeman. I did the Overland. I did the Cherokee. Um, most of them were work with the Star Tribune. Um, the last Again, couple were more fun than work. But like you say, the idea that being a journalist, you get to go and have these experiences and then write about them and share that with other people who don't get to have those experiences. And, and that's how I got the job doing the film stuff. It all ties together. So because I'd done, I'd already done those wagon trains and I was actually on the um, California trail wagon train the summer that the, the trail center started working on their exhibits. I had all that background and Paul Hutton knew that. And that's why he gave my name to the, the folks in Boston at BPI. And that's how I got started in films. And, you know, so one thing leads to another and it's, it is a, it is a small world. Even the West is a small world. The more you work in it and you get to know people and it's all about that network of, of folks that can help you give a hand up, give you a hand across is, is kind of that. I always think it sort of that cowboy way you help the people that helped you, you try to help them. And then you try to help someone else coming along behind on the trail. Well, you're doing a wonderful job of making those, those networking things happen. I want to talk for a moment about speaking of, of cowboy way and about the Wyoming history, your last name, Moulton, your husband, Steve, Steve right. Moulton, you, you started a project back in 1990, I believe it was, to save the Mormon Row in Jackson, the famous Moulton Barn, which everybody has taken a picture of in Jackson. If you go to Jackson, you take a picture of the Moulton, the Moulton Ranch. That's your husband's family. Correct. Correct. And so, so tell me the story about saving the Moulton, the Moulton barn, because that's a great story. It started with this story, Wendy. So in 1990, it's the Wyoming Centennial. 
And I'm go I'm in Jackson. And there was a picture of the Moulton Barn that was taken by Abby Garriman, great photographer in Jackson. And he owned under the Willow Gallery. And he took a lot of pictures of that barn, the TA. And I should clarify, it's the TA Moulton Barn, because there were two brothers there. There were three brothers there, actually. And so this this picture that Abby did was made into a poster called Wyoming Legacy. And it was a Wyoming Centennial poster. And I was in a in an art gallery in Jackson and some people were buying a copy of the picture and they asked this young kid who was working there, well, tell me about this barn. And of course the kid knew this, he knew it was the TA Moulton barn and he knew it was on Mormon row. That's what he knew. And I just stepped up and I said, well, I can tell you a little bit about the family and just like a five minute capsule of sort of why they'd come there and what they had done. And I went home, didn't think anything about it. And about three weeks or a month later, I'm in Laramie in an art I like art galleries. So I was in an art gallery in Laramie. Same, almost identical conversation, except that the person in Laramie at the at the um, gallery didn't really know anything about the story. Just, well, it's an important barn. It's a famous barn. There's a lot of pictures of it from Jackson Hall. And I went home that night and I said to Steve, this was 90, I said to Steve, I need to write that book. I didn't have any books out at the time. Okay. <laughs> I hadn't even written Steamboat. And I said, I need to write that story because people don't know it and people should know the importance of what that barn was. So that was my second book was the history of it. I call it legacy of the Tetons and it's the history of Mormon row, the homesteaders in, in grand Teton national park. When the book was coming out in 1994, the barn, literally the TA Moulton barn was starting to fall apart winter in Jackson usually has really deep snow and that barn was built started in 1912 through 1932 was a long <laughs> it's a poor ranch family so it took a while to build the barn and the north side lean-to had the the roof started caving in and it's like we're going to lose the barn and this thing had become really really an icon of Jackson i mean everybody takes a picture of it it's called the most photographed barn in america and that was in the 90s and it's still being photographed and so i said i need to write that story and so i started doing research and talking to the families and there were people still living there and and definitely connected to all of the families on mormon row there were many families there and so then when the book came out, the barn is falling apart. I called Sheila Bricker Wade at the State Historic Preservation Office. And I asked her about Mormon Monroe being on the National Register of Historic Places. And I mean, I could hear her hit the ceiling because she said, well, it's not. And it was in the park. By that time, it was in Grand Teton National Park. And there was a lot of I won't go into the politics, but there was a lot of back and forth between the state and the park about whether it sh should be on there. And at that time in the park service, there was sort of a movement that human history should be erased. Recent human history should be released from the park and it should be a natural space. Uh, it's just a, an evolution that the park service went through. So uh, Sheila and I got together and we decided we're going to try to do something to save that barn. And we did. And so I got the Moulton family involved. And on Labor Day um, in 1994, we went in. There were 100 family members that were there. And we restored that barn. We put the north side lean-to back together. We redid all the roofing. Sheila, with her team from State Historic Preservation, was there and did work. And they did interior stabilization. They put some cables in there to hold it and tie it together. And the park service was there. Melody um, Webb was the um, park superintendent at that time. And, and actually, a friend of mine, because her husband is Robert Utley, and he's a good Western writer. And so I knew Melody and I knew Robert. And she was there. And we stood there. And she said, I can't even believe this is happening. And it was all paid for by the family and by donations. And when the word got out in Jackson Hole that we were going to do it, there were contractors up there that would come and they'd drop, you know, shake shingles, a bundle of shingles or uh, some lumber or whatever. Well, this is left over from a job and you can use it. There was someone who brought a piece to the Chamber of Commerce that had been stolen from the barn, a piece of wood, and brought it 
to the Chamber of Commerce and said, I see they're working on the barn. This came from the barn. This is where it came from and you should put it back. And they brought it out and we reattached that piece. And so it was great. And, and the best part about that whole project, not only that we preserved that particular barn, but it was a catalyst for the park service and Habitat for Humanity got involved subsequently, and they did restoration at the, at the Chambers homestead. They did other work down at the John Moulton barn, and then the Park Service really embraced it. And now they've totally embraced it, and they are, they've got a big project that they're planning up there for restoration of those barns. And now they really interpret that human history, and they embrace it, and it's one of, a very busy part of the park. It used to be a very quiet part of the park. So we, we're really, as a family, we're very proud that we helped save it. And, and we're, we're really proud of it. We always said if, if, if we had even a nickel as a family, a nickel from every picture taken to that barn, there'd be a lot of money because everybody's there all the time. <laughs> yes. I've taken a picture of it back years and years ago. And I was there at dawn just yeah. to, to, to get the right, to get that right shot. But yeah. Candy, this has been such a fascinating conversation and you've got such a wonderful body of work, but we have to wrap up here shortly. I wanted to make sure though, that people know how to find out more about you. I love your website because it talks about not only the books and the films and things like that. It also showcases Steve's work. Steve is a, a very talented carpenter and furniture maker. I see, and I think he does some work in the Molesworth style. Is that correct? He does. He builds uh, only custom Western furniture, and a lot of it is patterned after Molesworth. He grew up in, he was born in Jackson Hole on Mormon Row at the T.A. Moulton Homestead. But when he was just six years old, they sold the part, bought the homestead back, and they moved to Cody. So he grew up on the South Fork in Cody. And so he um, he's a good furniture builder. His grandfather was a furniture builder. And he he really likes that Molesworth style. He kind of patterns after that. It's not identical, um, but and he only he just does private commissions. That's pretty much what he does. He built my bookcases that are behind me, but <laughs> they're yeah. wonderful. That yeah, I, I I'm I having a little more. bit of I'm having a little bit of a, a bookcase envy at the moment. But yeah, I need fantastic. more of them. I got them almost full. So <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, Candy. So so what's the what's the website? It's candymolten.com. Um, and, but it, our company, we, we work under the name of Wood Mountain Productions. Um, so I write, he does woodworking, he does some music, some Western music, and, um, he doesn't do as much of that anymore as, as he used to, but he, he sang at the ABRA ranch for 25 years every Friday night, got to go and sing around the campfire. So yeah. Keeping that Western tradition alive. Absolutely. He, he, he ran a ranch down in encampment. He grew up on a ranch in Cody and then he, he did a few other things. He worked for a furniture company for a very short time and, and learned how to actually do the finishing part, which is the hard part. And then he ran a ran He managed a ranch down in encampment for 25 years. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. So, so now he builds furniture. <laughs> now he builds furniture and, and uh, hangs out with you who gets to do all the exciting stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Candy, what is your next project? Tell, tell us just real quickly, what's your next project? I'm actually working on a project. I do a lot of work um, for museums and visitor centers, interpretive centers like the Trail Center in Casper. And I'm working on a project right now in Indiana for Indiana State Museum and Indiana State Parks. And it's a uh, it's very old um, Indian story related to the mound builder culture. So that's what I'm working on. It's got multiple films and I'm writing all the exhibit text. And uh, next book, I have one in mind, but I don't talk about them until I get them a little bit farther along. It's Wyoming though. I can tell you it's pure Wyoming. So, Oh, it's going to be great. Where do we find out the most recent stuff that you're working on? Where where can we keep up with, with your projects? Uh, well, <laughs> my website isn't up to date. But I'm going to get it up to date. That's one of my goals. It's like on the to-do list. Okay. Um, that's one place. And then I, I'm on Facebook, Candy Moulton. So, you know, I, I post on there. And that's kind of how you find me. Or you, I mean, I've been writing some for Cowboy State Daily. That's been fun. Hope to do more. I've been pretty busy right now. So that's why I don't write more. But um, yeah, writing my cowboy, write, writing about my cowboys for Wyoming Cowboy Hall of Fame. So, well, we look forward to 
to those every time. So thank you, Candy, And thank you for your time today. This has been such a fun conversation. And it's, I just feel like I want to chat with you some more because you've got such wonderful experiences. Well, thank you so much for bringing me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And folks, thank you for tuning in today to the Roundup. This has been such a fun conversation, but we've got more really great conversations coming up in the coming weeks. So stay tuned to Cowboy State Daily. Stay tuned to the Roundup. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a wonderful week.